The Canon 5D Mark IV is here, finally. It's been a few years. We're excited about it. It offers 30 megapixels, way better focusing, and uh, should just be generally better image quality. It's gonna be the go-to camera for wedding and portrait photographers. It's a jack of all trades and a master of none. We're not just going to repeat everything from the press release, which is what I see a lot of the press doing. We're actually gonna dig in. We've tested almost every component of this camera. So we have a lot of uh, good uh, sense for how it's actually going to behave when we get to test it in the next couple of weeks. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you can see the, the full hands-on review and comparison against other cameras. With uh, the body alone, it's gonna cost you about $3,500. With the 24 to 70 f4 lens, it'll go for $4,400. Or with Canon's new 24 to 105 f4, it'll go for $4,600. It'll be available in early September. Notice Canon is releasing a new 24 to 105 to replace their very outdated and pretty poor uh, old version of the 24 to 105, which I guess means I'll also have to get myself a new coffee mug. <laughs> uh, this is kind of the history of the 5D. Back in the film days, we were all shooting full frame cameras because it was film. And then in 2005, Canon released the 5D, which was my second digital camera. And when I bought it, I was so excited to finally be able to properly use my wide angle lenses. The 5D really changed everything. And then in 2008, Canon released the 5D Mark II, which introduced HD video recording. And that introduced the entire era of DSLR video. So we have the first two generations of the 5D just revolutionizing photography, really huge milestones in photography. Now in 2012, Canon releases the 5D Mark III, and it's not a revolution, it's an evolution. They improved the focusing system, made it generally better. And a lot of people are still using the 5D Mark III, especially portrait and wedding photographers. In 2015, we were expecting the 5D Mark IV, and Canon threw us a curveball and released the 5DS and the 5DSR, which were exactly like the 5D Mark III, except they had this 50 megapixel sensor, which has been fantastic. And it became our portrait wedding stock studio landscape camera ever since. We love the 5DSR. So now, 2016, Canon's finally releasing what they're calling the 5D Mark IV. And it doesn't have that amazing sensor from the 5DS and 5DSR. So it creates this weird conflict where it's better in some ways, but worse in other ways, even in their own lineup. So we'll go over it a little bit more. Of course, as I mentioned, it's a 30.4 megapixel sensor, which if you're using a 5D Mark III right now, that's a huge step up. If you're using just about any other camera in the same price range, it's kind of a step down though. To compare it against its peers, we can see that the, the 1DX Mark II has a 20 megapixel camera. And if you look at this chart, the little minus symbols next to the 20 there, that means that the sensor has an anti-aliasing filter, a sharpness ruining anti-aliasing filter. We find that the anti-aliasing filters reduce the sharpness of the image that you get by about 15 to 25%. It kind of depends on the lens that you're using and the AA filter. 5D Mark III at only 22 megapixels will have about 25% less detail than you'll get out of a new 5D Mark IV. But if you get a Nikon D810 or the Pentax K1, they have 36 megapixel sensors with no anti-aliasing filters, you can get about 30% more detail in, in our testing, according to what we've actually seen. Uh, now, the Pentax K1 also has this really cool pixel shift technology where it moves the sensor around a little bit and gives you much cleaner and sharper images. So it'll actually produce a much sharper image than we expect to get out of the 5D Mark IV. And the A7R2 has a 42 megapixel sensor, the 5DS, and even the Canon's own 5, 5DSR will produce about 50% sharper images. Now that's based on our estimates with typical zooms, like the 24 to 70 f2.8 zoom, the 16 to 35 f4 zoom, the types of zooms you would tend to use with these cameras. We expect to get about 50% more detail out of the 5DSR, but the real test will be coming up really soon. And that's a really big deal. If you're the type of person who cares about sharpness, if you want to crop heavily or make huge prints, you will see a huge drop in performance if you were to go from the 5DS R down to the 5D Mark IV. And that creates a real conflict for us personally because we love the 5DS R and I don't think I can give up that much detail. I just, I just don't know that I can bring myself to do it, even though there are lots of things that make me want the 5D Mark IV. A lot of you are going to be saying, oh, but megapixels don't matter. 
even eight megapixels is enough for an eight by 10 image, whatever. Uh, we have a whole video that kind of covers the importance of high resolution sensors in our real world experience, sdp.io slash MP, visit that link. And for those of you who are saying the reason they don't release a higher megapixel sensor is because of noise and pixel density and all of that, watch this video, sdp.io slash density for detailed information in our real, real life testing. The biggest question about the 5D Mark IV at this point, since we haven't had real production images yet, is the dynamic range. How is that? And we hope to get a camera in in the next couple of weeks, so we'll have it tested soon. Let's talk about video capabilities. Canon's really marketing the 4K video hard. So I know some of you are saying, I don't care about the video, I just want a stills camera. Why do you talk so much about video? Because Canon's talking about the 4K video. They're pitching this as a camera for filmmakers, and I'm not sure that any filmmaker would actually want this. I, I know I don't think I could recommend it as the camera of choice to people who are serious about filmmaking. It does support 4K video. That's a big step forward. Oddly, it's 4096 by 2160 only. They don't support 3840 by 2160, which is the standard 4K video on places like YouTube. And in this particular video, it goes up to 30 frames a second, uh, which is too bad. The Canon 1DX Mark II actually does 60 frames a second, which is unique and useful. Uh, so it's kind of standard 4K in that respect. But Canon did not implement a traditional video codec for their 4K video. And what that means is the video files are going to be much larger than they would be from other cameras. So for an hour of video, the A7R Mark II or the GH4, in our own experience, uh, each hour of video takes about 40 gigabytes. Canon's estimating that an hour of video from the 5D Mark IV, 226 gigabytes. That's a big difference. Four and a half times bigger the files are. And that's not like a higher bit rate or better quality. That's just fatter files because they aren't compressed efficiently. Each frame is, a, is its own JPEG picture. Most video codecs compare the difference between one frame and the next, and that allows for more efficient compression. It's just less efficient. It's not better. Big fat files are a real pain to work with. We found this with the 1DX Mark II when we tested it. It has a similar algorithm, and it basically made it unusable. It meant that we would never use it for real production. If you can imagine if you recorded one hour of video and you had to then deal with a 226 gigabyte file, we record several hours of video every week. It would be a total nightmare if we had to deal with that sort of compression. So that right there is a deal breaker for me if I were shooting 4K. I would not do it. There's another deal breaker and that's if you're going if you're shooting at 3840 by uh, 3840 wide pixels uh, video, you have a 1.75x crop factor to deal with, which is a huge crop factor. It means that when you're recording 4K video and publishing in that standard 4K format, not the wider film format, you're only using about 25% of the sensor, only about one quarter of that beautiful full frame sensor. And that's kind of ironic to me because when Canon released the 5D original in 2005, or I'm sorry, the 5D Mark II in 2008, the reason that started the whole DSLR video era is that you could record a full frame video with all your full frame photo lenses. That meant that you could get video effects that you simply could not get uh, with standard video cameras, at least not at that price point. Check out Canon's really, really cheesy promo video. <laughs> um, this sums it up to me for about the 5D Mark IV, meet all your photographic expectations, all around performer. And that's really what it is. It's, it's a jack of all trades. Um, but it's not a great overwhelming video camera. This is a huge crop factor. It means that if you put on a 16 millimeter super wide angle lens, it means you'll actually be shooting at about 28 millimeter equivalent angle of view. So you won't be, you just simply cannot get super wide angle views with 4K video. It also means if you're switching between stills and video, like you might if you were shooting a wedding, you'd basically have to change lenses. You'd have to switch from a telephoto lens to a wide angle lens to get the same kind of angle. It's gonna make everything kind of difficult. It also means that your resulting images aren't going to be as sharp if you're still using full frame lenses. Visit sdp.io slash ffcrop for detailed information about that. Um, so why is this? It's because Canon can't, the, the processor in the camera can't take all the pixels from the entire sensor and scrunch them down into a, st a standard 4K view 30 times a second. That is asking a lot. That's a lot of processing time. 
But cameras like the a7R 2 can do it. And that makes it immensely more useful for actual filmmakers, people who actually want to shoot in video. And so for that, the 4K video, to me, it's a novelty. It's in there. You probably won't use it that much unless... So just visually to illustrate how much of a crop the 1.7X is, uh, the, the white box on there is the crop that you would get out of a 1DX Mark II, the high-end camera. It's just, it's, it's a massive, massive crop. Talk about HD video for a little bit. Um, you cannot record 4K video out the HDMI port, just like the 1DX Mark II. It only puts out 1080p video over the HDMI port. Very strange. 1080p video does go up to 60p, not the 120p that we saw on the 1DX Mark II. Uh, 60p, 1080p video looks good. I like 60 frames a second video. It's becoming popular, but it's also kind of standard even among lower end cameras. One cool thing that Canon is doing with the HD 60p video is they're allowing you to blend it down into a 30p video with HDR. So Canon is shooting at 60 frames a second, but every other frame is underexposed and then overexposed. And then in camera, the camera is able to process them into an HDR video, bring down those highlights so the skies aren't overexposed, bring up the shadows so you can see just more dynamic range in it. I'm excited to test this. I wish it worked with 4K. It doesn't. <laughs> so it, it's kind of useful. Now, there are analogs for this. In the Sony world, I would just shoot with S-Log, and that would capture all that dynamic range in a single frame without needing to blend two images together. And then in post, I could choose whether I wanted to recover the shadows or blow it out completely. This HDR video, because it's done in camera, probably isn't um, the right choice for serious filmmakers, but more for casual filmmakers. Now, Another exciting feature about uh, the, the video in the Canon 5D Mark IV is the dual pixel AF, which a lot of the Canon cameras have had lately. And it's so much better than anything we see from any of the competition. Dual pixel AF from Canon works spectacularly to allow you to focus on even moving subjects. Uh, we absolutely love it. Um, in the Canon 5D Mark IV, it'll actually track moving subjects at up to four frames a second. So if you need to use live view and track moving sports or something like that, it can actually do it at four frames a second, drops down from seven frames a second. And, and it works so well that I wish they wouldn't hamper it with the design of the camera because the 5D Mark IV doesn't have a tilt screen. So if you do have to hold it over your head, it's kind of hard to see. And with a tilt screen, you could also bend it away from the glare of the sun. That's another thing that makes the standard screen on the 5D Mark IV difficult to use is sun glare. You also can't view live view through the viewfinder because it's an optical viewfinder and not an electronic viewfinder like we have on mirrorless cameras, which means you can't hold it against your face, which means you always have to hold it out like this or have it on a tripod and you have to always be at eye level. So live view is so good, Canon. <laughs> Give us an optical, an electronic viewfinder, or at least a hybrid viewfinder. Give us a choice and give us a tilty screen so that we can at least bend it down a little bit and get a little glare of the sun off or allow us to see it easier when we hold it over our head. If you are looking for a 4K video camera, there are lots of better options out there. Visit stp.io slash which camera for a full video, but I will specifically recommend at a similar price point, the Blackmagic Ursa Mini. It's just so much better a video camera in so many ways, and it uses real Canon lenses too. You can get an EF version. One of the features I think I'm most excited about in the 5D Mark IV is dual pixel RAW. This is weird. <laughs> The dual pixel AF actually uses two little pixels per pixel that see the light from different directions, one from the left and one from the right. And that's what enables this awesome focusing because it has a little bit of perspective on the, the shot that you're looking at. They're allowing you to capture basically, normally the, those two pixels are blended together. So you end up with one 30 megapixel image. If you turn on dual pixel raw, it'll be an option. You're actually recording two 30 megapixel images in each one of your raw files. So your raw file size doubles, but in post, you can use that extra depth information to very slightly shift the focus. Um, this could be incredibly useful for portrait and wedding photographers, allowing you to, if, you, if the camera accidentally focused on the eyelashes, you'll be able to pull it back and lock it in on the eye. And that happens all the time. If it focuses on the forehead, you should be able to fix that. 
focus can be off in various shots, not because of lens misalignment or anything, but just because that's how life works. Models move forward and back. The camera, you as a photographer, might move forward and back. You'll be able to fix that in post, and that could be so incredibly valuable. But there's one real big limit with dual pixel RAW, and that's that you have to use the Canon Digital Photo Professional software. And raise your hand if you're a professional wedding and portrait photographer and you use Canon software on a daily basis. No, nobody does. Everybody uses Lightroom. Some people might use Capture One, but nobody uses Canon software because it's not very good. <laughs> it's just not. It's just not very good. It's not great for your overall workflow. Um, I would bet that Adobe Lightroom will, or Capture One, I bet neither one will even be able to process the dual pixel RAW files at all, much less allow you to make these adjustments to focus. And if I'm right about that, what that means is if you shoot a wedding with dual pixel raw turned on, remember you can't make the decision in post, you have to make it when you're shooting, you won't be able to use Lightroom at all. You'll be stuck using the Canon software and that will kind of hamper your whole workflow. So you have this feature that you could use to improve your workflow by fixing focus problems in post, meaning you don't have to take as many pictures at the time because you'll be more confident that you can get one that, where the focus is nailed. But you're giving up all this time because you have to then use the Canon software and you can't use the software that you're used to and you have to toss out basically your entire post-production workflow. That's a big limitation, but it's something we'll have to test in the real world. So we're really looking forward to that. Other little aspects of dual cam pixel uh, raw is that you can shift the bokeh from left to right a tiny amount and you can reduce the ghosting. We'll, we'll just test it out. Uh, it has a touchscreen, as I mentioned. That's great. That's a big step up. We love using touchscreens. I know some of you complain, oh, it's going to hit your face or whatever. That never seems to happen. But when you're reviewing pictures, um, it, it speeds up your workflow so much. Uh, it also is really helpful when you're focusing in live view. It's more fully implemented than it is on the 1DX Mark II, so you'll be able to navigate menus and stuff like that. It's more like the, the touch that's built into the Canon 80D. They took the metering system from the 1DX Mark II as well, so it has this 150,000 pixel metering system that allows for um, ITR tracking, which is Canon's sort of uh, the ability to to change focusing points as a subject moves through the screen. It never worked quite as well as the Nikon's similar 3D focusing system, which is too bad. I love the 3D focusing system, but I just don't use Canon's ITR. Nonetheless, it's better than nothing, and this more complex metering system is pretty good at metering off of faces and, and more complex metering. Um, you still won't be able to track faces as well as you can in Live View, though. Another reason I wish we could get more out of Live View. It will shoot a full seven frames a second, which is a big step up from the 5DSR, which shoots only five frames a second, um, and a smaller step up from the 5D Mark III, which shoots six frames a second. If you're a sports shooter, though, you'd probably want to take a look at the uh, Canon 1DX Mark II, which will do a full 14 frames a second through with with focusing and stuff. So it's it's faster, but it's still not really a sports and wildlife camera. They did not change the memory card structure, which is which blows me away. I totally expected them to switch to CFast. Uh, they're still using CF and SD. And that's fine. That means you won't have to buy new memory cards for it, but it also means that your limit of 21 raw shots in a row is, is going to really hamper you. If you had a faster CFast card in there, the camera could be unloading those pictures and you'd be able to take more consecutive raw shots. So you'll be able to shoot for about three seconds before the camera starts to buffer. By comparison with the 5D Mark III, we regularly got about 36 shots on the camera. Um, the file sizes are bigger, so you it'll take a little bit longer to cram those onto the CF card. And they could have fixed that, but they didn't want to shift to a new technology with this camera just yet. 100% viewfinder coverage, which we've come to expect. They're using the same batteries. Same batteries, really, since the original Canon 5D in 2005. It's okay. Those work great. We never complain about the battery life on any of the 5Ds. They borrowed the autofocus system from the 1DX Mark II. We just tested that, check our full review of it. But the autofocus system is remarkable. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic, works really, really well, and tracks moving subjects spectacularly. It's got a full 61 a AF points, focuses in very, very low light conditions down to EV minus three with the viewfinder or EV minus four in live view. 
And that's just really dark. Like you can be under moonlight and stuff and it'll work well for you. It introduces F8 autofocus, which uh, allows you to slap a teleconverter on an F5.6 lens and still get good autofocusing. It's not, it's not a sports wildlife camera, but if it's doing double duty for you, you might like that. They added GPS capability, which I find to be terribly useful, especially for things like landscape and travel photography. GPS talks to satellites all around the world and pinpoints its exact location, burning a little extra battery life. But, but here you can see my own Lightroom view, and we just got back from Ireland, and you can see exactly where we shot uh, photos from around the country. And so in the future, I could think, hey, where's that picture that we took in Galway? And I could zoom right in and be able to find it. Or I could find a picture and say, man, I love this spot, but I wish I had better light. Let's revisit this exact spot. And you'd be able to look up the location on a map. GPS, fantastic feature. Glad that Canon put it in. Thank you very much for putting in that sort of consumer level technology. It's useful to everybody. They also added Wi-Fi, uh, which allows you to transfer pictures from your camera to your smartphone. And every year, social networking becomes more and more important to the photographer. And today it's a critical part of the work that we do and for everyone to build their reputation online. I know some of you out there don't do any social networking. You don't care at all. I care a lot. It's a big part of our business. Uh, unfortunately, it's Canon's same old Wi-Fi, which is not very good. It's just not very useful. Canon's not a software company. And you know it as soon as you launch that Canon Wi-Fi app. It's clumsy, it's a little bit slow, and the process of posting your picture on Instagram is is ponderous. Like It's faster than taking out your CF card and putting it in your computer and loading in Lightroom and uploading and all that. It's faster. You can still do it while you're having lunch at, and you're out traveling. But when you compare it to something like Nikon's SnapBridge, with Nikon SnapBridge, I take a picture on my D500 and oh, pick up my phone, load Instagram, and it's there. It's just there. There's no extra steps. Everything's transferred automatically in the background. With Canon's Wi-Fi app, the process is this. You turn on Wi-Fi in your camera. You don't want it on all the time because it would kill all the battery. Then you pull out your smartphone and you connect to the camera's Wi-Fi network. This disconnects your phone from the internet. So you can no longer, you can't immediately upload stuff to Instagram because you're not connected to the internet. Then you launch the Canon, Canon app. Then you browse your photos, transfer them over. They take a little while to transfer because they're pretty big files. Um, then you turn off the camera's Wi-Fi. This reconnects your phone to the internet. Then you go back into the Canon app and you share it, share a photo that you want to Instagram or Twitter or whatever. And then finally you're in Instagram or Twitter. And this whole process takes a couple of minutes. And that's a long time. And it's not a big deal to everybody. But as we're trying to introduce a new generation of photographers to real cameras, these, this new generation is getting started on smartphones and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. They're using social media and that's how they're learning photography. So when you tell them that this is how they can share pictures online, it's going to take a couple of minutes instead of taking a couple of seconds when they use their smartphone. It's going to be hard to convince people to switch from smartphones to real cameras. And so that's why I wish Canon would implement a better easier, more streamlined Wi-Fi process. Still, thank you for putting it in the camera. I'm glad. The rear display has 1.6 megapixels, so it'll be a little bit sharper than you had on the 5D Mark III. To uh, a slide from CameraSize.com, just to show you in comparison how it looks against a full-frame mirrorless camera or the 1DX Mark II. It's somewhere in between. We always like the 5D Mark III form factor. It feels great in the hands. Now I'm going to go through and compare the 5D Mark IV against its peers, basically. Starting with the 5DSR, Canon's previous generation of it. The 5DSR still priced about $200 more expensive than the 5D Mark IV, but it gives you a full uh, 50 megapixels. You'll see a couple of physical differences between the 5D Mark IV and the 5DSR. First, they, they moved the remote port to the front for some reason. Okay. Um, they also added this little button on the back here uh, that allows you to, by default, select different uh, types of AF, like group AF or whatever, but it can be reprogrammed to some other thing. So new button on the back. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as the 5D Mark III, as the 5DSR, basically physically the same cameras. It'll feel comfortable in the hands. The 5D Mark IV is better in every way than the 5DSR. Focuses better, has 4K video, has a touchscreen, has Wi-Fi, it has GPS, is about 10% lighter, but the 5DSR still has the better sensor. The 5DSR is still going to produce more detailed 
images. And I'm just totally torn. I don't know. We'll try it out. Um, the 5D Mark IV, as I said, has an anti-aliasing filter. So the difference is more than just 30 megapixels to 50 megapixels. It's, it's more than that. You'll probably see about 50% more detail when you shoot with the 5DSR. It's, it's going to be real hard for me to give that up and use the 5D Mark IV. Compared to the original 5D Mark III, uh, it's about $1,000 more expensive compared to what they're selling for right now. Um, the 5D Mark IV is just better in every way than the 5D Mark III. More megapixels, faster, better video, better AF, lots of new features, better screen on the back. If you are using a 5D Mark III and you don't want 50 megapixels, if that's just too much, if you just know Lightroom's slow already and you don't even want to deal with it, the 5D Mark IV is a clear upgrade. You will be happy with it. It will feel comfortable in your hands. And that's really what Canon is selling here. Lots of people are using the 5D Mark III for wedding and portraits. This is better. It's just better in every way. Let your 5D Mark III become your backup camera and use your 5D Mark IV as the main, and you will be happy. Compared to the Canon 1DX, Canon's top-end camera, the 5D Mark IV is going to be better for most people. Even though the 1DX Mark II is more expensive, the Canon 5D Mark IV with its 30 megapixels will produce sharper images. Um, it's not as fast, but portrait and wedding photographers don't need 14 frames a second generally. Uh, the 1DX Mark II has better 4K video, but we still don't recommend it as a 4K video camera. We would recommend something else over that. The 1DX Mark II has a bigger buffer, a limited touchscreen instead of a full touchscreen, and it's lacking features like Wi-Fi and GPS, which are terribly useful. Compared to Nikon's current alternative, the Nikon D810, I'm hoping to see a Nikon D820 here real soon, the D810 is substantially cheaper. It will also produce sharper images because of its 30 megapixel sensor with no AA filter, but it's slower. It does not record 4K video. They both have very good AF, but I know because the 5D Mark IV has the 1DX Mark II's focusing system that is going to be slightly better. Um, the 1DX or the 5DSR, 5D Mark IV also has a touchscreen GPS and Wi-Fi, which the DA10 lacks. Compare it against the Pentax camera at this price point, the Pentax K1. The Pentax K1 is significantly cheaper, but Canon lenses tend to be a little bit cheaper, especially because there are more full frame lenses available on the used market. The Pentax K1 will produce sharper images, especially because of its pixel shift technology, which adds stabilization to any lens, even if, if the lens is not stabilized. And this is so terribly useful. I love pixel shift. Pixel shift also enables technologies like it, it will automatically level your handheld pictures in case you're off level. That's fantastic. It just rotates the sensor. It's such a great technology. I'm so bummed that Canon isn't introducing any sort of sensor stabilization. Check out our full review of the Pentax K1 to really see all the huge advantages that this camera has, especially for travel travel and landscape photography. Unfortunately, the Pentax K1's focusing system is kind of a bummer. The 5D Mark IV will certainly blow it away. Um, and while the Pentax K1 is a tilt screen, which you liked, it does not have a touch screen. Canon, of course, lenses. Canon just has more lenses than anybody and Pentax's full frame digital lenses are pretty limited right now. Compared to Sony's camera at this price point, the a7R2, the a7R2 is just a hair cheaper. It has a 42 megapixel sensor without an anti-aliasing filter, so images are going to be significantly sharper, still images, but it's slower. The focusing system is going to be far worse. Um, the 4K video out of the a7R2 is going to be vastly better because you can shoot either full frame or with a 1.5x crop feature that we absolutely love. It also has an electronic viewfinder. So it's just basically an all around better video camera for you. It has features like focus peaking, which you totally want, and you can adapt about any kind of lens to it. But for stills, the 5D Mark IV is going to be generally a more useful camera because of the superior focusing system. The A7R2 also has sensor stabilization, which I was talking about, all the usefulness for that. The ability, the ability to use fast primes for handhold low light work is spectacular and something we're still entirely missing from the Canon world. So lots of things to love about the 5D Mark IV. What are some of the disappointments that I have? First, no low ISO. It still has a base ISO of 100, and that's fine for most people. Most people never complain about the amount of noise in an ISO 100 image, but especially as megapixel counts go up, you want to make bigger pictures, and you can really see noise, especially in like solid primary color areas like a nice blue sky. You'll have visible amounts of noise in there, and I can fix that in post with retouching, but that takes a little bit of time. Um, the D810 and the Pentax K1, they both shoot at 
a proper equivalent of about ISO 50 producing cleaner images in, in studio environments and such. So I wish Canon would go ahead and lower the ISO for us. Also, I've mentioned a few times, but they have a low-pass filter and anti-aliasing filter on that. This is sharpness ruining. It is literally there to reduce the sharpness of the image, and in practice, it's supposed to reduce moiré, odd patterns that you get from uh, fabrics and things like bricks. And it does that, but moiré is not much of a problem. It's almost never a problem for us, and we shoot with cameras that don't have AA filters all the time. You'll see 15 to 25% increase in sharpness when you take off that AA filter. And what that means is your cheap lenses start to be as sharp as really expensive lenses and your expensive lenses are mind numbingly sharp. It just makes better images to take off that AA filter. Nikon has taken off of all their recent cameras. Sony, no AA filters. Pentax, no AA filters. Canon still with the AA filters. It's kind of outdated. They still have that retro LCD on the top. I know people are tired of hearing about it from me. You can make a touch OLED displays. We have seen this on cameras like the Phase One, like the Leica SL, and even like smaller, cheaper cameras from other manufacturers will have color touchscreen OLED displays that use almost no battery life and are more visible in daylight. They can be dimmed in dark light. There is absolutely no advantage of the retro style LCDs, except that it doesn't require any engineering effort from Canon. This is a $3,400 camera. Canon is time to improve that top LCD a little bit, allow us to reconfigure the display so we can make it uh, show just the information that we need and just overall look nicer. I promise we've used cameras with it. It's a functional improvement that will make your life better and will not consume extra battery power. They have a touchscreen, but they're still using the same old button-driven user interface for everything. It's like these people have never used a smartphone. <laughs> really, use your smartphone and then use your camera's menu system. It's appalling. It's so outdated. The menu system really hasn't changed much since the original 5D. It's time to implement a proper UE around a touchscreen. No tilt screen, no EVF. These are incredibly useful things. Just spend some time with like, a Sony camera that has these features and you will learn to love it. The EVF shows which parts of your picture, shows your exposure in your viewfinder. So there's no chimping. It eliminates chimping. It means you get the shot right the first time. With an optical viewfinder, you really don't know if you're over or underexposing it. You get a feel for it over time. But with an electronic viewfinder, you know. And electronic viewfinders nowadays are excellent. There's almost no lag. The resolution is absolutely awesome. All those problems that you were familiar with, with early mirrorless, mirrorless cameras are gone. It's time to offer a hybrid viewfinder that switches between optical and electronic viewfinders. Fuji did it. It's time for Canon to do it. There's no proper silent shooting. There's still like quiet mode. Um, I guess you could record 4K video and pull stills from that, but silent shooting is really useful for discreetly shooting and for a wedding or portrait photographer, wedding photographer, or somebody photographing in church or a photojournalist or a street photographer, proper silent shooting is an incredibly useful feature. It's also missing lots of like obvious video features if, that you'd want as a filmmaker, like focus peaking and zebras or can, Canon log. Instead, you have this like HD only HDR thing, which just isn't ideal. And as I said earlier, no sensor stabilization. I would kill for a Canon camera with sensor stabilization. This is such a game changer when you have cameras with it. I've been using sensor stabilized cameras for many years now, still nothing from Canon. So, oh, and they have the same Canon Wi-Fi. I wish they would make a new app. We'll have a full proper test coming out. Subscribe to see that. It should just be in a couple of weeks. We're excited to get it. It's not the revolution that we were hoping to see, but it's an incremental improvement and it should be the camera for portrait and wedding photographers. If you're interested in improving your skills, I have a whole series of photography books covering all the basics of photography, as well as using Lightroom and Photoshop. I have a whole gear dedicated, a whole book dedicated to camera gear, and we have video training too. You can get all that at Amazon by searching for my name, Tony Northrup, or visit our store, stp.io slash store, starts at 10 bucks. All these include tons of high quality video and we ship worldwide. If you do pre-order, please, please use our link sdp.io slash 5d4. We get a few pennies out of every dollar. Thanks. Share, like, write a comment if you have any questions. Bye.